Father, we uh, come in this room with, in, in myriad circumstances and states this morning. Um, some of us are on top of the world and full of joy and excitement um, because of great things that we're, we're experiencing, exciting things happening around us. Um, others of us feel uh, discouraged. We feel um, despair, and we're struggling with fear and doubt and all kinds of things. And we're all across that spectrum everywhere in between today. Um, and we acknowledge that, but we trust, we know that there is one thing that all of us need uh, at our core, and that's to behold your glory. We need to, um, in your word, gaze again at who you are and at what you have done for us in the gospel. So I pray that the light of Jesus would shine this morning and that the things of earth would go strangely dim as we gaze on your glory. Be lifted up, be magnified as we do that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so this morning, what we're going to do is read Isaiah, part of Isaiah chapter 6 in portions throughout the service. We'll read it responsively, so that's up on the screen. There's going to be cues that'll tell you when I'll read something and then when you'll read in response. Um, and that's going to form kind of the, uh, the arc of our service today. Uh, because Isaiah chapter 6 gives us this, starts with this vision of God and his holiness and his majesty and his justice and all of his glory. Um, then it moves and it, 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 in response to that, it confronts our sinfulness and our weakness in light of the holy, righteous God. It confronts the chasm that we'll sing about later that lays between us and the holy God. But it assures us of pardon, and forgiveness, and grace and salvation in Christ. So we're going to read that broken up in a couple different spots, uh, and then we'll sing some songs that let us respond to those truths. So let's stand and let's read together. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory.
the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me in every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me sing that again then came the morning then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body Salve! 
its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living song blessing your name telling of your salvation that you have graciously poured out on us Uh, we want to declare your glory among the nations declare your marvelous works among all the people and especially today we want to declare your glory and your marvelous works to each other to our brothers and sisters gathered in this room as we uh, remind each other and rejoice in who you are and what you've done for us We worship you in the splendor of your holiness. We fall down on our faces in awe and in reverence because you are that holy and great and majestic. But we come to you boldly 
like little children knocking on their parents' door in the middle of the night for a drink of water. Because in Christ, that's the kind of access you have granted to us. So we praise you, Lord, for, for your glory. We praise you that you are holy and righteous and beyond our comprehension. But we praise you that you have condescended to us in mercy and grace beyond anything we can possibly fathom in Christ. We praise you that you have made us your own people. But we confess, Lord, that we often forget these truths. We confess that in our own minds, and then by the things that we say and think and the ways that we live, we diminish your glory in some sense. Not that we can make you less glorious, but um, we either consider you to be less glorious or we display you to be less glorious. We worship idols. We forget your goodness and your grace and your faithfulness to us. So forgive us, Lord, and remind us again today as we um, read your word and pray it and sing it, and as it's preached, remind us again of these truths. Remind us of your glory. Remind us of your grace in the gospel. Uh, we want to pray that as we do that, you would um, energize us and send us out on mission. We, wanna, we want to declare your glory among the nations. We want to take the good news of who Christ is and what he's done for us out with us to our uh, friends and our family and our neighbors and our coworkers and everyone that we come across. We want to take it around the world. So I pray this morning that you would um, inspire, energize us, call us to that, and send us out on that kind of mission. We want to be an outpost of the kingdom. We want to see many people pass from death to life in Christ uh, because of what you do among us and because of your work through us. Uh, we want to pray particularly this morning for those in our church family who are getting ready to start a, a, a new school year and a very strange school year. So we have uh, many people who are teaching in one setting or another in, in private or public schools or homeschool. We have um, others who are part of administration, lots of people who are involved in um, uh, the educational experience. And this year is going to be such a uh, unique and probably sometimes difficult and stressful year for them. Uh, and so we pray that you would um, give them grace and strength and energy beyond what they normally have to navigate the difficulty of um, for some of them, online teaching. Um, for some of them, having classrooms that are split between online and live, just so many things that are unpredictable. We pray that you would uh, strengthen them to work as unto you for your glory. And we pray most of all that you would glorify yourself through them, that they would have these kind of missional opportunities in the uh, different mission fields that they find themselves. Uh, let them carry the name and the good news of Jesus out with them as they teach this year. Lord, we also want to recognize and thank you for the fact that we are not worshiping, we are not gathered uh, as a little island, but we are part of a massive global body of Christ who gathers today lifting up one name, doing the very things that we are doing, celebrating the same things that we celebrate. So we praise you for, uh, for our solidarity with Christians around the planet today. And we want to pray for one local church in particular, uh, Christian Family Chapel, and for Doug Rutt, their lead pastor, thank you for uh, a church that is doing that kind of gospel-centered, words-saturated ministry and mission. Um, thank you that we're able to be partnered with them in that mission in Jacksonville. And so we pray this morning the same things that we prayed for us, um, that the name of Jesus would be glorified, that they would behold again the gospel and be changed and be sent out on mission uh, as we ask for our church. Uh, finally, Lord, as we prepare now to hear your word preached, would you illumine us? We ask that your spirit would take the truth of that word and teach it to us, apply it to us, convict us, encourage us, change us into the image of Jesus for the glory of Jesus. We pray in his name, amen. All right, as we uh, wrap up here, um, I just want to share a couple of things very briefly, things that are coming up in our church. Uh, first, if you are uh, new to our church, maybe this is your first, second, third time here, you're still wondering what we're about, we are going to have a very short, very casual class next week called, called What's Next? Um, this is just to introduce you to our church, very briefly. Um, that's going to happen right after the first service and before this service, so it'll run for about 20 minutes from 1020 to 1040 next week. Um, and it's just going to give us a, ch a chance to kind of say this is who we are, where we've been, and where we're going. So we would love to get a chance to introduce ourselves to you if you are new. Um, 
So we'd love to have you stop by next week. That's going to be straight through these back doors. Take a left, and then the first classroom on the right, which sounds confusing right now, and I know because I am extraordinarily directionally challenged, so I would end up in the parking lot with those directions. But uh, we will have some signage and some people who know where to direct you if you are interested in participating in that class next week. Um, if you've been here for a little longer and you're curious about what the next steps might be to join our church as a, as a member, we've got an exploring membership class coming up um, in three weeks on September 13th. That's going to happen on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock here. We'll meet together, and uh, this is basically expanding on the material from that first class. We're really going to dig into who we are, let you know kind of our uh, theological distinctive distinctive, some of our core values, and then uh, dive into what it looks like to be a member at Community Bible Church. What does it mean to partner on mission, to grow in the gospel and go with the gospel at Community Bible Church? So if you are interested in membership, um, you can come talk to me or stop by the welcome desk on your way out, and we can give you some more information about that class. You can get registered. It does not obligate you to join our church. We're not going to chase you down two weeks later and say, why haven't you joined? Um, this is just something to kind of introduce you and hopefully uh, help you to make an informed decision about whether you would like to, uh, to join with us as a member. And then finally, uh, Community College was scheduled to start this Wednesday for a variety of reasons. We've had to bump that start date back one week. So that's going to kick off a week from this Wednesday on, on uh, September 1st. Um, the registration has also been backed up. Actually, the registration has just been opened up, so you could actually... Uh, connect to it even a couple weeks in if you wanted to. So this is a perfect opportunity. If you've been on the fence about whether to participate in this semester of community college, this has given you a little bit longer to think about it and register. Um, and if you've got questions about that, you can talk to John Sweat or, again, stop by the welcome desk, and they can uh, get you any information that you need. Matt? Good morning. Nice to see all of you this morning and worship with you. Looking forward to getting into our uh, last message in Proverbs with you and then sharing the Lord's Supper together at the end of the service today. This is, as I said, the, uh, the last message in our series through the book of Proverbs, and I hope it's been helpful to you. Um, it's, hopefully it's been helpful for you in your own personal reading of Proverbs to uh, be able to dip into that book more, to understand how Proverbs uh, fits in the flow of biblical revelation and get an idea even of how the book of Proverbs points us to the person and work of Jesus Christ. If you missed the first message on that, we laid some things out for principles for interpreting Proverbs and seeing how it points us all to Jesus. And so if you want to go back on our website, you can listen to that. But one of the things that Proverbs does is equips us as followers of Jesus to live wisely in a world that has been broken by sin. This world has a lot to offer. There are a lot of beautiful things to see, a lot of amazing things to do. But we all understand at one level or enough or another that that something is fundamentally wrong with the world. God's Word gives us wisdom as, as followers of Jesus to navigate that. So I hope it's been helpful to you. If you've been doing the devotional book with your family throughout these past 10 weeks, I hope that's been good for you. If you are not doing any sort of devotional things with your family, don't let it die with the book. There, the Bible is going to continue even though the devotional book is over. And so look for new ways if you need ideas um, I'd be glad to talk to you. There's others who would be glad to talk to you, but it's um, important that we, as, as husbands and wives, or whether you're a single parent or whatever, that we read the Bible together and pray with our families, that we disciple our children. So use the habits that you set there to keep going uh, along with your family in that way. This morning, what I want to do is I want us to see how the book of Proverbs guides us in making wise decisions. How the book of Proverbs leads us to make wise decisions. We are faced, you are faced with a steady stream of decisions that you have to make. Some of them are relatively minor, but more often than not, we are continually having large decisions that we're having to make, life-altering decisions. In fact, there are probably people here in the room this morning who are wrestling through a significant decision which could perhaps alter the course of your life. 
When it comes to decision making, there are all sorts of things that the Bible is abundantly clear about, aren't there? The Bible tells us that you, if you're considering marriage, you ought to marry somebody who is a Christian. The Bible tells you as you're looking out at your life that, and you want to have a family that you ought to be able to provide for your family, that you ought to be willing to work. The Bible tells us that being a meaningful part of a local church is something that is extremely important. God's will is revealed to us throughout the scriptures in a variety of ways, both in what it tells us we ought to do and what it tells us we ought not to do. So one of the things that the Bible says is this, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Your sanctification is your pursuit of Christ-likeness. We pursue through the power of the Holy Spirit Uh, becoming more and more like Jesus. We pursue holiness. We pursue living out what the Word of God leads us to do. That's not something you have to consider. God's, you don't have to think, I wonder if I want to pursue Christ-likeness. I wonder if I feel like living a whole life. I wonder if God is leading me to do that. Well, you don't have to wonder Because God has already clearly communicated in his word that the will of God for every believer is their sanctification, their conformity to the image of Jesus. The Bible also communicates what God prohibits, the the will of God and what he prohibits. And so the Bible says things like uh, uh, that, that uh, we should not pursue, uh, the, the, the will of God is that we should not pursue sexual immorality. That's, so that's not something that you have to think about. It's not, when you have the opportunity, you don't have to consider it. God has made his will abundantly clear, abstain, not even a hint of sexual immorality be named among you. It's clear. So the Bible provides for us a lot that we are to do and that we are not to do. But the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how we are to do some of those things. The Bible does not tell you exactly who you're supposed to marry. If you're considering a career path, you're considering a school to go to, the Bible doesn't tell you that you need to go to this university and that you need to follow this career path. The Bible tells you that you ought to be a meaningful part of a local church, but the Bible is not going to tell you exactly which church you should be a part of. The Bible is not going to tell you what house to buy. The Bible is not going to tell you what major investments to make. The Bible gives us all kinds of information, but there are many specifics that it doesn't communicate to us. And so we are left wondering how we are going to make those decisions. And sometimes we operate as if we understand that God is in charge of life, He's in charge of our lives, He has His will for us, and so God's will for us must be, must be hidden somewhere, and it's my job to find that secret, hidden will of God through a series of hoops that I jump through and a series of steps that I take. And so there oftentimes we make decisions the wrong ways. We have, and I'm going to give you three examples of well-intentioned but wrong-headed ways of making decisions. So I'm, I'm, being, I'm being gentle and kind here because I have personally tried to make decisions these ways, well-intentioned but probably illegitimate for the most part ways of making decisions. The first one I call the peace test, the peace test. We make decisions for ourselves based on whether or not I personally feel a sense of peace about the decision. The way I feel about the decision determines to some degree or another whether it is the right one or not. Now, Is having peace good? Yes. Jesus tells us that he wants us to have peace. The Bible tells us that we, in the midst of difficult circumstances, can have a peace 
that passes all understanding. But we also must recognize that there are times when our experience of peace can be subjective. And in fact, that there's times when we have peace about things that we ought not have peace about. Have you ever had a Christian friend tell you that they are about to make what everyone knows is a sinful decision, but justify that decision by the fact that they have a peace about it? I have. There are people who have justified leaving their wife or their husband for no reason other than they just don't particularly like them anymore and justify it by the fact that I I believe I have peace about that. Well, frankly, no one cares whether you have peace about it or not because the Bible has communicated God's will to you regardless of how it makes you feel in this particular situation. We should want the peace of God, but on the other hand, we ought to, you ought to, I ought to have a healthy sense of distrust of our own hearts. Sometimes we have peace because we're getting what we want. And some of us have made a whole string of decisions that we have had a ton of peace about because it just so happens that God's will happens to be whatever I'm feeling like doing. That's why we have to be distrustful of peace. And there are many times when God is directing us to make a decision for which we will not have peace. Where making a particular decision is saying no to ourselves or what we want. Where making the right decision is creating conflict. And so we need to be careful that we don't find God's will solely using the peace test. There's a second illegitimate way of finding God's will, and that is what I call the fleece test. I've got three of them, and only two of them rhyme, and I just want you to know that bugs me a little bit, but couldn't find a third rhyming word. But for the second one, it does rhyme, and it is the fleece test. And if you don't have a bible background, then you're wondering, what in the world are you talking about fleece test? Well, this is a callback to Gideon in the book of Judges. Gideon in the book of Judges is secretly threshing wheat in a hidden location because he doesn't want the country of Midian, who's oppressing Israel, to come in and take from the wheat from him, which is what they were doing. They were going in these raids. They were wreaking havoc on the people of Israel. So he's hiding and doing that. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and tells him, guess what? You are going to be the one that liberates Israel from the oppression of the Midianites. Now, if you had the angel of the Lord appear to you and give you direct instruction, that would be a great thing, wouldn't it? There have been a few times in my life where I would have loved to know from God directly through the angel of the Lord what decision I was supposed to make. But apparently that wasn't enough for Gideon. And Gideon decides that he's not quite sure about it And so he asks God to do a couple of things to clarify and confirm whether he really wants him to be the one to liberate Israel from Midian. And you may remember this story, but Gideon asks, uh, Lord, uh, I'm going to put out a a fleece of wool, and I want, uh, when I wake up in the morning, I want the fleece to be dry and the grass around it to be completely soaked with the dew. And he wakes up the next morning, he runs out to check the fleece. The fleece is, is dry, the grass around it completely soaked. Uh, we better do a second one, though. And so he says, let's reverse it this time. And he says, let, this time, let the fleece be completely soaking wet and the, ground all, and the grass around it be completely dry from the dew. And he wakes up and he sees that it's that way once again and he knows that indeed the Lord has spoken to him. And we often talk about that, if you're around Christian-y people who use christian words, we often talk about that in terms of putting a fleece out. So if you've ever wondered what in the world Christians are talking about when they say that, we have all these insider things that we know and that's one of those insider things that you know, now know. However... One of the things that's important to remember as we read the Bible is that not everything in the Bible is prescriptive. So we've got the difference between things that are prescriptive 
and the things that are descriptive. Things that are de- descriptive are saying, this is something that happened. Things that are prescriptive are, this is something you ought to do. And let me tell you, there are a lot of things in the Bible that are described that you definitely should not do. They are descriptive, not prescriptive. And we have to rely on the context to help us make a determination about that. Well, one of the things that Gideon is, is criticized for in this text is his lack of faith. One of the things that the author of Judges is, is demonstrating is just a complete lack of faith that follows Gideon, not only through these incidents, but really throughout the entirety of his life. But what we often do as Christians is putting out a fleece, is we arrange a set of circumstances by which God will confirm what I am supposed to do. And so I really want to ask this girl out. So Lord, if she's the first person to walk out of the classroom today, I will know that that is the girl, even though I've never spoken to her before, that is the girl you want me to marry, whether she knows it or not. And so I wait outside the classroom to see, is she going to be the first one to come out? We set up circumstances, like if this set of things happens, that's how I will know what you want me to do. But this is not a reliable or a legitimate way of making decisions or finding God's will. And the story of Gideon is not there to teach us how to do that. There's a third illegitimate way well-intentioned but illegitimate way of seeking God's will, and that is what I will call the verse test. The verse test is where I read the Bible looking for some sort of verse that is going to somehow tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do in this big decision. I'm reading the Bible looking for clues to the answer of a particular question, who I'm supposed to marry, what house I'm supposed to buy, whatever the case may be. Let me give you an example of how this is sometimes done. I'm considering whether I am going to take a new job, and there's a job opportunity in Arizona, and there's a job opportunity in Delaware. And I don't know because I like Delaware, I like Arizona. They both have the same pay. Everything seems good. Which one should I take? And so I'm reading in the Old Testament one day, and I see that God led Moses and Israel into the desert. (laughs) Arizona, it is. Now, we're laughing about that. But we do stuff like that with the Bible, and people do stuff like that with the Bible all the time. They find some sort of verse to speak directly to their uh, uh, situation, and we find comfort in doing that because now I know when I make the decision and I do the thing, I have a verse that told me to do it. Here's a principle that you can write down that is going to be helpful for you whenever you read the Bible, and it's this. This is a principle of biblical interpretation. A text cannot now mean what it never meant. Say that again. A text cannot now mean what it never meant. And using that principle of interpretation is going to help you interpret the Bible better so that you can understand what God actually intended to communicate rather than my subjective experience of what the words happen to say. Neither the peace test, nor the fleece test, nor the verse test are good ways of determining God's will or making wise decisions. But this morning, I want us to see from the book of Proverbs five principles for making wise decisions. Five principles for making wise decisions. And here is principle number one. Live in the fear of the Lord. Live in the fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, puts it this way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom, and instruction. We talked about this in the very first message in this series, but one of the interesting things about the setup of the book of Proverbs is that Proverbs starts 
with the fear of the Lord. If you want to be knowledgeable, if you want to be a person who is wise, then everything starts, square one is living in the fear of the Lord. So what is the fear of the Lord? Well, Pastor John preached on this, the, the fear of the Lord, at the beginning of our series, so I'm not going to rehearse everything. But he talked about the fear of the Lord from Proverbs as friendship with God and fullness of life. The fear of the Lord is living with a God consciousness. It is recognizing that I walk out my days, I think my thoughts, I experience my motivations, I choose my words, I choose my actions. Everything I do is done before the Lord in a God consciousness that I am under His watchful gaze. And I must live with a reverence for him. The fear of the Lord is not the fear that if I happen to make a wrong move or a sinful choice or the wrong decision, that God is immediately going to come down and smack me. But the fear of the Lord recognizes that we serve a sovereign, holy God. When you look at the encounters of people that people have had with that sovereign, holy God in Scripture, they fall to their knees and they say things like, woe is me. So we live in the fear of the Lord. To live in the fear of the Lord, to to use a Latin phrase, is to live quorum Deo. The late R.C. Sproul said this about that phrase. This phrase literally refers to something that takes place in the presence of or before the face of God. To live quorum Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. And he finishes this way. To live in the presence of God is to understand that whatever we are doing and wherever we are doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. And we are living under the gaze of God whether we acknowledge it or not. But a wise person lives in light of the knowledge of the fear of the Lord. And throughout the book of Proverbs, it provides a contrast to us with the motivation of the fear of the Lord for our decision-making and other motivations that would would. would Uh, 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 corrupt our decision-making process or hurt our decision-making process. And I don't have time to spend a a lot on this, but let me just share a few of them. First of all, the fear of the Lord prevents us in chapter 3 and verse 7 from overestimating our own wisdom. A lot of times we tend to think we know more than we do. We tend to evaluate our own wisdom more than we do, and so we live in the light of our own wisdom more than the fear of the Lord. In chapter 15 and verse 16, uh, the fear of the Lord is contrasted with the motivation of greed. How often have we made decisions in our lives, important decisions in our lives, honestly, and the bottom line factor for how we make that decision is, will it get me more stuff? How many times have we made decisions that way? It's just, will it get me more? Now, God gives us opportunities to get more. We praise him for it. But but living in the fear of the Lord will counteract being driven by greed. A third example is found in chapter 29 and verse 25. We make decisions on the fear of the Lord rather than making decisions based in the fear of man. How many of us continually make decisions more weighted on what other people will think about those decisions? Some of us are particularly afflicted by the fear of man. The fear of man is the thing that controls us and constrains us and causes us to make our decisions. But think about it. When we are making decisions based on the fear of man, we are saying, Lord, I care more of what the people around me think about my decisions than I care about what you make. You think about my decisions. 
I reverence the opinions of the people around me more than I reverence what you think. Living in the fear of the Lord prevents us from making decisions, fear-based decisions on what other people will say or think about the decisions that we've made. Now let me pause for a moment and say something to those of you who may be with us this morning who might not be followers of Jesus, because this fear of the Lord is an important concept for you to understand the Bible, for you to understand God himself. The Bible basically summarizes the core problem of the human condition as a failure to fear God. It was that way from the beginning, and it continues that way to this day. Beginning in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, the Bible tells us this terrible thing. It tells us that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of humanity who suppress the truth. God's wrath is something that we like to slip in the back door sometimes in our sermons and in our thoughts, but the truth of the matter is God's wrath is clearly displayed in the pages of Scripture. And God's wrath is displayed against humanity because we know God exists and yet we refuse to acknowledge his rightful lordship over our lives. We know that we ought to fear him, but we choose to go our own way. We refuse to live as if we are accountable to him. And that sinfulness is summed up in Romans chapter 3 and verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So let me just say to somebody here this morning who's maybe with us and does not know Jesus, we love you enough to tell you that the Bible says that God's wrath remains on you for your lack of fearing God. But the Bible gives us the good news of Jesus. It tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 that at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, which means people like me and people like you can actually escape God's wrath through Christ. How does that happen, you ask? That happens when we simply repent of our sins. We repent that we have gone our own way, done our own thing, failed to fear the Lord, lived as if we are the standard for our lives. We repent of that sin and we turn and we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that when we turn in faith to Christ like that, he washes us clean, he forgives us, he makes us brand new and helps us to now live and walk in the fear of the Lord. Lord. And if you want to know more about that, any number of us would love to talk with you about it after the service. So the first step to making wise decisions is living in the fear of the Lord. But here's the second step for making wise decisions from Proverbs, and it's this, walk in the light of his word. Walk in the light of his word. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23 says this, For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. Proverbs compares God's revelation of his commandments, those things that I was talking about just a few moments ago about about this is the will of God that you do this or that you abstain from this. Proverbs compares the commandments of God to a lamp or a light for our path. In Psalm uh, Psalm 119, which is an extended poem in praise of God's word, verse 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my to my path. Several years ago, before we moved here, even before we even had any kids, I was on a mission trip in Africa. And we were going to finish the trip by moving from Tanzania to Kenya. And between Tanzania and Kenya is the Serengeti. And we were able to go on a safari in the Serengeti 
uh, at the end of that trip. And one of the things that I was really excited about was the opportunity to see lions chasing other animals. But lions don't do that in the daytime. And so I was very disappointed on that part of it. The lions were basically napping a lot in the Serengeti when we drove by them. But it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing to see as a kind of a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But the place that we stayed that night was actually there in the park, and there was a, a, a dining hall of sorts where you could eat, and then there were little, little tiny huts or cabins that you would go to. And I can remember leaving that dining hall that night and walk, stepping out by myself because I'd stayed longer than everyone else, and I had to walk back to that little hut by myself when I realized they did not put lights anywhere in this place. And it was pitch black. And I knew the general direction that I was supposed to be going, but as I'm moving carefully along the path, I'm hearing little skittering sounds in the leaves, and I'm wondering, are those little things? And I'm remembering that lions, which are asleep during the day at the Serengeti, are very active at night, and I am staying in the Serengeti. And it's at that moment that I wished more than anything that I had some sort of flashlight so I could see where I was going and if there was a lion just sitting there licking his lips waiting for me to step into his open mouth. That's what life is like without the light of God's word. It's darkness. No wonder people feel such anxiety. No wonder people feel such existential crises as they go through life. They are fumbling through the darkness, and yet God has given us the light of his word to show us the path. God has not left us without direction in this world. I had a seminary professor that used to say all the time, there are all kinds of things that you just don't have to pray about. And the reason you don't have to pray about them is because they're right there in black and white. It is what it is. God has given us the light of his word. And that doesn't mean that he's necessarily going to give us the specifics in every situation about who to marry or what job to take or the various big decisions that we have to make in life. But he has shown a light onto our path and given us the guardrails of life. Thirdly, We need to acknowledge the fact of his sovereignty. Acknowledge the fact of his sovereignty. That's the third principle for making wise decisions based on what Proverbs has to share with us. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33 says this, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. A lot was something that was used to select someone or something for some reason. If you were looking for a modern day equivalent of the lot, it might be the flip of a coin, like what we do before football games. And why do we flip a coin before football games? It's supposed to be a random way of determining who gets to either have the ball first or choose the side of the field that they want first. It's, a, it's an impartial and random way of making a selection. Yet Proverbs echoes the rest of Scripture when it tells us that there is not so much as a coin flip in the universe that is outside of God's control. Now here's why this is important. We often view the soundness of our decisions based solely on the results of how they turned out. Now, let me give a disclaimer on this. If you make terrible decisions your whole life, you're going to have terrible results. <laughs> and the results should say, hey, maybe I should make better decisions. Okay? There's a caveat. But we often try our best to make good decisions and then view the soundness of those decisions based solely on the results. We often believe that if we're able to somehow figure out or get God to show us exactly what it is that we're supposed to do, we will make the quote-unquote right decision, and then that decision will turn out quote-unquote right. 
which is however it is that we drew it up, however it was that we planned it out. But here's the problem with that. You can't manage the results. You can make wise decisions all day. I can make wise decisions all day, but we are woefully inadequate to control even the smallest instances of our lives. So when we're making, if we're going to make wise decisions, we have to make those decisions submitting them to the sovereignty of God who does not even have a coin flip escape his control. There, you may not have known this, but there are actually three founders of Apple. Most of us have heard of Steve Jobs. If you're a nerd, you've heard of Steve Wozniak. And if you're even more nerdy, I guess you're me, and you've heard of the third founder, whose name was Ronald Wayne. Ronald Wayne is the unknown third co-founder of Apple. He's the one that drew up the articles in their opening days. He even is the one that drew up a logo that they eventually did not use, but he's the one that drew up the logo. He was involved in it, and he had a 10% stake in the company. 12 days into it, Ronald Wayne started looking at things, saw that Apple had got their first big sale, but saw that if those people did not actually pay for those computers, the company would immediately go out of business. And he noticed to himself that these two other guys named Steve didn't have houses or families or anything, but he happened to have all of those things. And he realized that if, if, if things went wrong, it'd probably be his assets that were, that were up. So 12 days after founding Apple, he sold his 10% share back to them for $800. That 10% share of Apple would be worth $80 billion today. And actually, somebody came up to me after the first service, as people often do, and corrected me, as people often do, and said that the number was $200 billion. So... 80 billion, 200 billion, I'd be fine with 1 billion, I'm not picky. <laughs> a lot of money he did not get. You compare that with another investor named Chris Saka, whose first tech investment was made using $25,000 checks from two credit cards. In other words, he put $50,000 into a tech company with money that he did not actually possess. And then he loved it so much, he decided to go all in even more on a small tech company that he was excited about. He began by using other companies to buy up shares, ended up getting 15% of that company, and when Twitter went public, he found himself to be a billionaire. Which one was right? You know, it's easy for us to look at somebody like Ronald Wayne and say, man, wrong decision, buddy. Ronald Wayne was making the best decision that he had, he could, with the information that he had at the time. He could never have known that Apple would become apparently a trillion dollar evaluated company. The truth is that we make a very small part of the decisions, but we have to trust God in the decisions that we make. We have to acknowledge that we're going to make the best decision that we can about who to marry or what house to buy or what career path to take and recognize that because not even a coin flip is outside of his control, we can make big, scary decisions and even have them turn out badly and still trust that God's going to take care of us no matter what. If it all falls apart, God's in control. If it goes the way we scripted it, he gets the glory. Number four, we'll move through these last two a little bit more quickly for time's sake. But the fourth principle for making wise decisions is inviting the safety of counsel. Invite the safety of counsel. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14 says, Where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. It is almost never a good idea to make a significant life decision alone. 
Oftentimes, we are too close to the situation, we are too close to the decision to see clearly. Oftentimes, our motives are not clear to us. Have you ever been having a, a, a conversation with a Christian brother or sister, as you're talking to them about something, your own motives start to become more clear because of their questions that they're asking you, and you realize that they weren't quite as pure as you thought? That's the beauty of Christian community. Oftentimes, the intense desire for something or someone overrides a wise decision. There are warning flags in this person that I am dating, but I want them so badly I go over all the speed bumps. I don't have enough money to buy that big thing but I want it so bad. Counsel and friends can help us from making bad decisions if we will listen to the wise people that God has providentially placed into our lives. Five, the fifth principle is this. Enjoy the freedom of wisdom. Enjoy the freedom of wisdom. Let me explain what I mean by that. I've said before throughout the series that Proverbs oftentimes personifies wisdom as a woman who stands out and calls out to everybody who's passing by, begs them to receive wisdom. So it personifies wisdom as a woman doing that. And we can see an example of that in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. It says, does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries aloud, to you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. She goes on to say that, Wisdom, in verse 11, is better than jewels. It's better than riches. It's better than wealth. And then if we skip ahead to Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 to 12, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord, looping the fear of the Lord back in, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. Here's what Proverbs is telling us. Proverbs is holding out not the promise of secret knowledge. Proverbs is holding out the possibility of becoming wise. When you live in the fear of the Lord and you walk in the light of His Word and you acknowledge the fact of His sovereignty and you invite the safety of counsel, you can then enjoy the freedom of wisdom. You can make a decision in confidence, recognizing that you don't know how it will turn out, nor can you control it. The Bible isn't going to make every single decision in your life for you. I would love it if the angel of the Lord would appear to me at every major juncture and just tell me. And some of us, I think if we're honest, have have become disillusioned with God because He hasn't written it in the sky. There's a a big decision that we need to make, and I've prayed and prayed, and I've asked for God to tell me, and I feel like the skies are silent. And it can be disillusioning to us. Sometimes, in various ways, God just tells us. But the Bible doesn't lead us for that to be our normal experience, that God is going to tell each one of us every single decision along the way the way. Rather, the Bible tells us that if we'll follow these things, we will become wise people. 
So let me finish it this way. If you're trying to make a wise decision, I want you to know God is not playing a game with you about finding his will, which is the way sometimes we approach it. God's will, he knows what it is, he's hidden it somewhere, and now I got to go find it. And, I gotta, and if I don't find it, the consequences are disastrous because that will put me on plan B, and then God's got to figure out how in the world he's going to reroute me back to where the place I was supposed to be. We sometimes treat God's will like it's like this national treasure movie where I've got to go from this place to find this clue and this place to find this clue, and I finally arrive at the destination. It doesn't work like that. Yes, God has his perfect, secret, sovereign will for our lives, but then God equips us through faith in Jesus to make wise choices. The Bible wants us, according to Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." And we talked about this at the very beginning, but one of the things that Proverbs does, one of, the, one of the places that it has in Scripture is it talks about wisdom and it points ahead to a perfect wisdom that is revealed in Jesus Christ who is called wisdom from God. Do you want to make wise decisions? Follow Jesus. Know Jesus. Believe Jesus, trust Jesus, because in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Then in the decisions that we make, we can be free, knowing that whether they turn out the way we wanted to or not, God works all things together for good. The good decisions we've made, bad decisions we've made, all of it. He works all of it and reroutes it so it ends in good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So let's pray and ask God to do that in us. Lord, this morning as we Consider the wisdom of Proverbs. I pray that you would make us people who are wise. I pray that you would help us to live each day of our lives knowing that we live them out under your watchful gaze. I pray that your commandments would be sweet to us, that they would light our paths. I pray that we would find a rest in your sovereign control. I pray that you would give us the humility for advice and counsel. And then I pray that you'd help us to make wise decisions, knowing that you're working and will work always, all things for our good. Lord, if there is someone here this morning who has not lived their life in the fear of the Lord, I pray that they would feel your wrath upon them now so that they can turn and escape your wrath through faith in Christ. It's in his name I pray these things. Amen. Well, in our remaining time today, we are going to share the Lord's Supper together. And as we do so, I want to read to you a couple of verses from Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew 26, verse 39 says this, And going a little farther, he fell on his face, referring to Jesus, and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This gives us an example of Jesus not following the peace test. He sees the cup of the Father's wrath coming. And he knows the pain that, that his sacrifice is going to bring, and yet he prays, not my will, but yours be done. Verse 42, again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. 
The Bible tells us, and what we celebrate in taking these elements together this morning, is that Jesus Christ on the cross drinks the full cup of the wrath of God. And he does that so you and I may never have to experience an ounce of it. That is the thing we celebrate this morning when we eat the bread and we drink the cup. Let me give you a few instructions. Let me say, first of all, who can participate in this? The Bible tells us that the Lord's Supper, communion, what we're about to do, is something that Christians do. And so if you are not a Christian or you do not know what it means to be a Christian, we would kindly ask that you refrain from participating in this. And we ask you to refrain from participating, not because we want to exclude you or we want to be mean to you or hurt you anyway, but because the Bible tells us that by eating and drinking these things, we are declaring that we believe in the sacrifice of Christ and have received the forgiveness of sins. If that's not you, refrain from participating, but do this. Participate in this way. Pray. At your seat, whether you've ever prayed before, whether you feel like you know how to pray or not, pray. And ask God to help you understand your own heart, the sinfulness of your heart. Ask God to give you the gifts of repentance and faith while we do this. As we've been doing for the past few months, we have these self-contained uh, cups so that we don't have to pass them all around and make their way down to the back. And so in just a moment, we're going to have somebody that's going to dismiss you. Let me tell you, as I do each time, that there is a clear plastic layer at the top, which you peel back where the wafer is, and then there is a purple layer underneath it where the juice is. You want to pull off the clear plastic layer first. And I know this by experience, and I don't want you to have to know it by experience. You peel the clear plastic layer off first, and then we'll give instructions, and you can, clear, you can, uh, can tear the, the purple layer off. I will also warn you that when you pull the purple layer off, it spits a little bit of, of juice out. You're going to want to point that away from your shirt and away from your neighbor, somewhere at the floor or out or something like that, um, because it does, it does do that a little bit. So um, I'm going to now have uh, Kevin... Um, dismiss you, and as he dismisses you, he's going to go down the center aisle, and he's going to have you come out this way, grab one, and then return to your seat on the outside as well. And we're doing that so one of us doesn't accidentally kick over the camera or the computer. So, Kevin, go ahead and dismiss, folks. Verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 11 says this, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Lord, in raising these elements to our lips this morning, we are declaring and drinking this cup that we have escaped the full outpouring of the cup of your wrath. It has been poured out, swallowed up by Christ. And yet we believe that death has been swallowed up in victory. That the grave has not held our Lord and Savior, and that the grave will not hold us either. We take these things not only as an act of faith in your work, but we take them as an act of unity among us as Christian brothers and sisters, Lord, may that act of unity be so. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 6 one more time. And uh, it ends this section with a response. So in light of seeing the uh, glory of God and the grace of God, there's a response of surrender to the mission of God for the glory of God. And so when we understand who God is and what he's done for us, our response is lives that are lived, breathed for the glory of God. Our response is to carry the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done out with us. Amen. So in response to what we have seen and heard and sung and tasted this morning, let's stand and let's read this and then let's sing. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? 
and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain. Tell me, what is your life amidst that vanishes at dawn? All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. is above who is himself our daily bread praise him the Lord of love let living water satisfy the thirsty with a prize will a cup of kindness yet all glory be to Christ all glory be to Christ our King all glory be to Christ his rule and reign will never sing all Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in his grace.